every step you take on the earth should be one of absolute gratitude because everything comes from nature. When we die, we go back to nature. And the fact that, that you guys, you know, are, are oblivious to that is in, like incomprehensible to so many people. Speak the charm of me. There will come a time on the planet Earth when science and technology will be long forgotten. When wizards will lose wizards. This is the Arnamancy Podcast. The world is weirder than we know. Join your host, Reverend Eric, in his diverse array of amazing guests in an exploration of tarot, magic, the occult, and the history of Western esotericism. The Arnamancy Podcast exists thanks to the support of generous listeners like you. Please consider supporting this podcast for as little as $1 a month at patreon.com slash Arnamancy. Welcome back to the podcast. My guest today is Denny Sargent, also known as Ion131 and Hermetico Snuff. He's a Seattle writer, artist, and university instructor whose extensive global travels and esoteric studies informed the backbone of his numerous published books. Involved for decades with many esoteric traditions, Denny has published works on alternative religions, hermetic magic, Taoism, animism, Shinto, and Tantra. His published books include Global Ritualism, The Tao of Birthdays, Your Guardian Angel and You, Clean Sweep, The Book of the Horned One, Naga Magic, Dancing with Spirits, and what we are talking about today, Werewolf Magic. (laughs) That was a very nice introduction. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, I am so excited about this. You know, like we were just talking about, um, I was... uh, you know, when I was a kid, I, I loved werewolves. And um, earlier in 2021, I suspect, that's probably when it was, I read this book called Werewolf Histories, which is a great book, but it's very academic and very dry. And it totally made werewolves so boring in my head. And I, I guess I was in a little bit of a werewolf funk. And then you contacted me and you're like, I've got this book, Werewolf Magic. And I was like, yes, they're back. <laughs> we never we never left we always <laughs> it was it was just a short break it was just a short break <laughs> i understand exactly i have a whole uh whole shelf full of werewolf books and three quarters of them three quarters of them are very interesting they're historical and and so on but then and then you have you know a quarter that are kind of wacko and um you know the truth is somewhere in the middle actually it's it's there were real werewolf cults and the histories go on and on. If you read the Roman historians or the Greek historians or others, mm-hmm. uh, you'll see that, you know, all over the world, all over the world, at least the Western world, we've had werewolves. In other countries, there's different were animals. In China, it's were tigers. Um, in Morocco, when I travel through Morocco, they talk a lot about were hyenas. Um, so this idea of, of transforming has been with us since the dawn of time. So. Oh yeah, and it's but even the fact that like the werewolf legend itself has existed for so long in um in Europe and the Middle East and it's just like you know, it goes all the way back. Like our, some of our earliest stories have werewolves and stuff in them and yeah. uh and also some of the best movies of the 20th century have werewolves in them. <laughs> Thank you. I agree with that. I get a lot of grief about that when I say that. But you know, the earliest werewolf I found is a 40,000 year old wall painting in Portugal of a werewolf. It is clearly a half man, half wolf for the spirit. So, yeah, and, and the um, it's noted that's my dog, um, of course, on cue. Um, if you when you get to that part of the book, I actually have a reference to it that 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 wall painting with a little quote from the anthropologist who connected it with shamanism, animism, um, and, and lycanthropy, which I was a godsend for me because it was like, Oh, okay. First it was in my head and this guy's a PhD. (laughs) Well, I, uh, I've been enjoying the book. I haven't finished, I haven't finished the whole thing yet, but I really have been enjoying it. It is, um, you know, it's published by, Llewellyn, and I think it, it probably falls more into their, 
You know, I mean, they're well inserted as a range of stuff where some of their books are like pretty lofty and t- difficult and dry. And this is more on the like really practical side. Like you're sort of like, here's an experience I had. Here's how you can replicate it. Here's what werewolf magic can look like. And it and and your voice in the book, uh, like I appreciate it. You know, you start off sort of saying like this book. It, in fact, this is something that I've been... Well, We'll, we will talk about this in a little bit when we start to get into the specifics, but like, I feel like one of the things that you've done really well in the book is sort of balance this thing between like, you know, exploring werewolf magic is about kind of like diving into your wilder side. But at the same time, like, here's some systemic stuff that you can do. Here's a system you can build on. Here's a framework you can operate in. And I thought that was a interesting balance. I... I and reading it, I kept thinking, like, man, this couldn't have been easy <laughs> to put together sometimes. Um, the hardest yeah. part was keeping it focused. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I'm, I'm a historian. My master's is ancient history and intercultural communication. So diving, the balance for me was getting, once I discovered that this wasn't just something that was, you know, a delusion or, or at least not completely what, um, I started finding historical references all the way back and, and, and as you saw, as you see in the book, because you've read a lot of it, and I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, you know, in ancient Greece, in ancient Rome, um, the Vikings, um, the Celts all had werewolves and werewolf cults. And, and it was a commonly accepted thing up until the 1700s that werewolves were real. So now we've, we've inherited tropes and, and Hollywood, you know, mm-hmm. Hollywood mm-hmm. stuff. That is, it's, it's so, so people laugh and they go, oh yeah, that's just, you know, Lon Chaney howling and, you know, at the moon, but, right. but it, it was a very real serious thing. And historians like Herodotus and, and, and Levy and, and uh, Plutonius all, all reference like having met werewolves and seen werewolves and gone to places and seen people shapeshift. And th- these are, these are historians who really tried hard to, to say what they saw. And um, what they saw from their pagan point of view was people going into trance states and, and quote unquote, shapeshifting into a different um, consciousness, which we isn't in part of our Judeo-Christian culture anymore. So we just right. think of it, as, you know, oh, you, you sprout fur and, you know, your face goes, you know, which would be fun, I'm going to say, but no, I don't think that's really what I wanted to do. You know, I mean, some of us are hairy enough already. <laughs> Yeah, right. <laughs> I'm, I'm in that. I'm in that. The older I get, the more wolfy I get. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so, um, so, uh, exploring like the concept of werewolves and like seeing that there were like werewolves in history and stuff is is one thing. But like, what really drew you to the concept of werewolf magic? Like, tell tell us that story a little bit. Okay. Um, without getting too high drama, um, I went through a period. You can of get life. you can get high drama. I'm cool with that. <laughs> I drama. <laughs> okay, so I, I about five years ago, my entire universe exploded, um, and and it's it's I can go into detail, but it's hardly worth it. But I, but but my I lost my house, lost lost my um, lost my relationship, lost lost everything, lost my my then my job disappeared because of COVID. I, I was teaching at a university, and that went so. I mean, I was like, I went from like a rich, full, complicated life to, you know, I was completely destined. My finances weren't, weren't good. And I was, um, I was deeply depressed and just, I figured, you know, I'm older and maybe this is, this is the end of, of my life, you know? And um, I meditate every night, which is a saving grace. And I recommend to everybody. And um, I was meditating and all of a sudden this, things come when you meditate but all of a sudden this this wolf showed up in my meditations on a regular basis which had no connection with any of the the mantras i was doing or the meditation sequences i was it just would come and sit and it was a wolf with three eyes and with a third with a third eye and i just kind of you know slowly started to like realize that this was a spirit of some kind that was sort of stepping into my meditative spirit and uh it started to tell me things. It started to say, look, I'm, 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 you call, you actually called me here and I'm trying to, I'm trying to teach you or show you some things you need to do. And it said, listen, you need to, you need to get out. You need to get out. You're, you're being, you're being crushed and destroyed by 
the culture that you're in by preconceived notions by your past by by how your parents raised you by the religion you were forced into by by everything people you you're, you're being crushed by this weight of restrictions that society and and everything that you've gone through have placed on you and you need to get out you need to get out and and so i just threw one day i just i just snapped i just threw stuff in the car and i drove up into the mountains because you know, you live in, you live in Oregon. I live in Seattle. Oh, there's a great mountains. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. An hour and a half away. I'm in the Cascades and I just pulled my car up and I just ran into the woods and ripped off my clothes and lost myself completely and just sort of threw myself on, on mother nature and, and the, 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 the Lord of the forest and, and said, you know, if, if this is when I, if this is my end, then this is my end. If it's not my end, then you know, take, take, just take all this crap off of me. And I had, I had a, you know, a, a, a great cleansing, powerful time and just stopped thinking and stopped uh, cognating and ripped away as much of the dross and restrictions that were wrapped around my, my head and my consciousness and came out of it completely different. Um, and that's when I started. And then, you know, the, this being, this great wolf spirit, as it were, has been around forever, I guess. Um, and I've talked to shamans who have wolf spirits, and you know, so the wolf spirit is a thing. Sort of was with me the whole time, and 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 was like, okay, you know, now you now you're raw and you're ripped clean. Like, what are you gonna do? And I will. Oh, oh, oh. And so let me. So I'm just gonna tell you, like, what you what you did was you 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 released the beast that you are, you release your, I, I started coining the term animal self because I didn't know what else to call it. And then I started researching and, and I, you know, I hit people like Carl Sagan's idea of the, of the, of the dragon brain or the, the lizard brain in the back, you know, the, the mm -hmm. upper cortex and lower cortex. I had studied some neurology um, because of my, my son has, has a lot of, a lot of issues. And so I, I knew something about the amygdala and the frontal cortex and the lower cortex. And I realized, Oh, the, the trick is to to slip out of your upper cortex and down into your lower cortex and just access all the ancestral memory and genetic memory you have of being a beast because we 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 encode all the DNA of all the animals out there. Um, we are ninety eight percent the same as a chimpanzee genetically, right? And eighty three, eighty four percent the same as a wolf. So so that all of these things kind of swirled around and emerged. I just started taking copious notes, of course, and, and I'm writing and writing and writing and writing. It never occurred to me to write a book about this. This is, was my own personal, you know, salvation, as it were, you know, to, to, to break free of everything that was making me, you know, crazy and sad and old and cranky. And uh, so that, so, so, you know, <laughs> I, and so I came back and I'm, I'm, I'm a completely different person, I have to mm -hmm. say, in the last five years. Um, if you look at a picture of me then and you look at a picture of me now, I literally look 10 years younger now than I did then. I was grossly overweight and my hair was bright white and I looked like I was on my last legs. And I totally don't feel that anymore. <laughs> well, that's kind of amazing. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I don't know. I sound like a testimonial, but you asked me, like, how did I fall into it? The, the funny part about it being a book is, I had, like I said, I hadn't planned on doing this. I just had pieced things together. I was writing a book on Tantra and I was writing a book on this. So I went to Pantheacon. Um, some friends like grabbed me and pulled me to Pantheacon and urged me to do this. And I brought with me five book proposals because this is something I know how to do. And this is what I've done in my life is I come up with a book that I like. I, I, I pitch it and then sell it and then, you know, so one of them, I, I tagged on werewolf magic as a, as a sort of almost like a joke. I was like, all right, I'm just going to, you know, my friends were like, no, 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 you need to do this. I'm like, nobody's going to want this. This is crazy, you know, but all right, all right. Because I, I really wanted to sell my Tantra book and went on occult travel and, you know, I had all these things. And I put them in front of um, the, the wonderful and very, very lovely acquisitions editor for Llewellyn and also the acquisitions editor for Wiser. And they went through all five of them. They went, no, 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 no. Oh, we want, I want this one. It was werewolf magic. And I'm like, are you kidding? Seriously? And, and, then, I, and then I would talk to the, I talked to the, the, the lovely woman at, at Weiser and she did the same thing. Oh, we want this one. And I said, well, and, and then it worked out that, you know, she, uh, the, the, the uh, acquisitions editor for Llewellyn had, had said yes first. So 
they, they had a collegial relationship. And so I ended up with Llewellyn, but, um, and I'm glad I did. They've done a, a, a wonderful job. Yeah. It's a pretty book, but like, that is, that is a strange story because you have to admit that the title sounds kind of corny. Of course. Like werewolf magic. Sounds, and it reminds me, uh, I don't know if you read Llewellyn books in the, in the nineties, but they had. Oh, no, 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 no. Seventies, oh. seventies. Okay. I'm, well, I'm older than you think. <laughs> yeah. But you know, there was that series of books that they had that must just, I don't think it started in the seventies. It probably started in the eighties, but they had like, you know, uh, Celtic magic and dragon magic and elf magic and like all these things that sounded like somebody at TSR had just pooped them out and been like, I'm going to sell these to, to those uh, granola knuckleheads over at Llewellyn. Uh, but, so, but you know what? You know what? Some of them were good. I was, yeah. When I was a teenage, when I was a teenage witch and pagan in the seventies, some of them were really good and really important. And 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 you know we can, and and also it was the era. You know, this is how things were. Yeah, I and I mean, I certainly bought some. I bought a bunch of when I was a teenage witch Here and pagan know. too. I mean, I guess, uh, I guess if it weren't for those books. But I'll say this: they've changed dramatically. They're being really um, mm-hmm. even even harder than than I would like um, about about getting things accurate and and footnoting everything and uh, um, catching me catching me on things that are vague. And I'm, I'm since actually kind of as as a historian, I'm kind of excited about it as mm-hmm. third. It's like a little tiring, but it's also I think it's a good thing. I yeah, yeah, I would I would agree. Like. Uh it's it's at least easier to weed out uh, or to to notice the good books in Llewellyn's catalog mm-hmm. now. So yeah, mm-hmm. they're definitely doing a lot better. Yeah, no, they're doing great books. They're doing. I have a bunch of friends who publish for them, and they're doing really good stuff. Mm-hmm. Did you like the subtitle uh, "Authentic Practical Lycanthropy"? <laughs> <laughs> Like, I, that, that was me. It, that was sort of totally. like okay. I mean, maybe authentic makes sense, but how can it be practical? <laughs> <laughs> well, you haven't read the second part completely yet. Have That's you? true. Okay. Well, I mean, let's. So, uh, so one of the things that, that that I have questions about, since I haven't gotten to the second part, so you went through this experience in the wilderness. So it was a it was an initiation of a way of a sort, right? It like was. You totally. It was an yeah. yeah. So it was either the 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 three eyed wolf or your own animal self or some combination of those things Correct. led you there through you this yeah. thing, this sort of waking up. So, so, so then it was, okay, what do I do? Right. Mm -hmm. And then, and and so then I I sat down and said, okay, and I meditated and I invoked this particular entity. And I said, now what? And it goes, okay, fine. Now that you popped your, you know, popped your cork and you're able, you're able to access your, the feral part of you that is not about intellectualizing every bloody thing, but simply accepting like animals do the way things are and, and being much more intuitively connected with the ec- ecosystem and everything. I'm going to give you some rituals to do, and I'm going to tell you what to do. First thing is your rituals. Most of them shouldn't have any words at all. They should, they should, they should have growls, howls. I have an entire, entire lexicary. I have an entire language that's built into the book and wait till you see pack magic. I've expanded it. I call it wear lingo. That's what I call it because I'm, <laughs> I'm a goofball at heart. I'm a goofball, but um, and so and so, like a lot of my rituals were me out there, like up growling, down growling, up howling, down howling. I don't know if that makes sense to you, but it's like and bringing the energy up, down, but by by bypassing my up by by bypassing intellect, by bypassing um, language and and grammar and all that stuff. But I was able to access directly a lot of these this feral magical stuff, this powerful stuff, mm-hmm. words and chatter and, and and the stuff in your upper mind, you know, your upper cortex and, and your intellect, just blocks anything, you know, anything that that's primordial that's happening with you. So so I started writing rituals, and then every full moon I would clock myself, I'd go out. I lived in an apartment at that point in, in the middle of seventy acres of woods, if you can believe it. And I would go out in the middle of the woods and I would rip off all my clothes and, and, and do my thing and howl and, and kept waiting for the police to arrest me. Nobody did. So that was a good thing. I'm sure I scared the hell out of people. But um, coyote, so a couple of other things started happening. All of a sudden I had owls coming to my apartment mm-hmm. and coyotes started running by my window at night. Oh, and wow. I thought I was hallucinating. Like I did a big ritual and I was in this liminal state. 
and I went to sleep and I had this dream that the were the werewolves came for me, you know, and I, and I ran off with them as a werewolf. And, and I kind of woke up in the middle of the night and I heard this howling and thumping and I couldn't, I was like, am I dreaming? What's going on? And I went outside the next day and outside my window were all these paw prints. Ooh. So stuff started to happen. I mean, mm-hmm. call it what you want, synchronicity, magic, whatever. This was, this was moving forward and building. I had no idea where it was going. And I just kept writing and doing rituals and drawing and drawing. And I've, by the way, I have a stack of like a hundred werewolf paintings that came through me at that time. And I just put them up. I'll send it to you. Okay. Um, Okay. Yeah. A friend of mine just put them up in a museum gallery online. So you can go through the gallery and see all my werewolf art. (laughs) I am making a note to get a link to this that people can get it in the show notes. Oh, okay. Sure. That'd be great. My friends think I may have gone overboard a tad, but you know, well, that's what we do. That's what us werewolves do, right? Yeah, I guess. I get, yeah, yeah. I mean, a, a little out of control. It so. sounds. It sounds. <laughs> fa- it sounds fun. Honestly, it sounds fun. Um, so I have to. I have fun to is it? Ask. Fun the, is it? Yeah, yeah. So you've you've done uh, you've done esoteric uh, and magical practices that involve like chanting and tantras uh like barbarous names and like you know i mean there's all these there's all these other practices you know like the pgm has like things that you howl and hiss and all this kind of stuff i use some things from the pgm in my Ooh, book well that's State. exciting i'm looking forward yeah. to uh, coming across those but, I, I'm a, I, I hang out with ceremonial magicians i do stuff with golds and dawn people I'm yeah in, I'm in the OTO. I used to be in Kenneth Grant's OTO, Oof. which makes which makes me a werewolf right away. <laughs> <laughs> and I was a, I'm an initiated third degree Welsh traditional witch. And uh-huh. I mean, I could go on and on. I was involved in all kinds of pagan groups, and you know, I'm one of those people. You know, I go to a Shinto shrine and, and get and get blessed, and you know. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I'm kind of all over the place. I have to say, I like it all. I'm interested in everything. Yeah, I guess. Well, here's here's a question I have for you then. So like. I get a feeling in a lot of the, especially like the uh, ceremonial magic traditions where there is all of these, you know, there's, it's so intellectual. There's so many like connections to keep in mind and there are the correspondences and there are like specific chants. Or if you're doing like Kabbalah, there's like, you know, the chanting of sacred names and all these things. I've always kind of got the impression that all of that was done to keep your intellect distracted, to be like, okay, intellect, here's something for you to do so you can get the hell out of the way. That, that may be that may be true. I, I, I hesitate to say that about okay. that, but I would certainly say about mantras. Mantras have a twofold purpose. So, for example, Om Namah Shivaya is a mantra that I use. I, I use a lot of them, but they they both they both contain a vibration, mm-hmm. like Om, you know, is a is a is the vibration of the universe. But they also, as you're chanting, they keep your your conscious mind distracted, so that you can have a direct per, a perception of the what is behind the vibration that is in the key bija mantra the the key sound right right so, so for example like um we just had diwali and i did a huge diwali festival and i have this huge altar set up and um so i invoked lakshmi well, her bija mantra is shring so so that both is her that literally is her like her vibration is her it's i can't explain it but that's how it is in tantra Mm-hmm. So she is that vibration, but it also describes her. And when I do like a, a man, you know, a mantra like Om Ring Shring Lakshmi Namasva and do that a thousand times or whatever, I'm getting two things happening. One, I'm, I'm invoking the vibration of her. So she actually manifests as an energetic force, but also it distracts me from thinking about, oh my God, I forgot to do this yesterday and I need to go to the store and blah, 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 you know, so I think there's two angles to it. Right, right. Well, I guess so that makes it sound... I, I, what I was trying to do is I was... <laughs> What's your dog's name? Faunus. Faunus. Good name. Who's in the book? Who's in the book? <laughs> so I guess uh, what I was trying to sort of like get at is your description of your howling language, your wolf language, mm-hmm. kind of made me think about some of the stuff that, that other magical languages or other magical practices involving language try to do. But I, I mean, did you see that? Were there similarities or was it pretty different? So, so I, in werewolf magic, the whole werewolf lingo thing was essentially to get away from language. Like, mm-hmm. cause I teach language, I teach linguistics. That's what I do at a university. Right. And, and I'm, I'm a big fan of language and words and all that stuff, but 
it also locks us into our paradigms that we were, that we had foisted upon us as kids and removing yourself from that linguistic all those linguistic centers in the upper brain and just going down to you know brings you out of all that cognition and all those interconnections with stuff that, that is in your head and and sort of brings you down to a much more primordial place so so the first book the one you have i talk a lot of, and then i managed to sort of figure out that that you could you could roughly do evoking bring bringing the energy up with with an up how right or you can bring it down with a oh and these are things that real wolves do and real animals do right well in the new book that i'm i'm almost done with mm -hmm. i realized that there are certain I, I i every time i do my thing on the full moon i get more gnosis in terms of this even though i'm kind of like okay am i done with this no you're not done with this all right fine so and there, I now have Bija mantras, which you're the first person to hear about uh, on, a, on an interview, Ooh. which is, um, so like, um, for example, the earth mother is, ah, right? Mm -hmm. And then, and then the, the Lord of the forest is, ah, right? And yeah. Then, and then the moon mother is, ah, and then the, the wolf spirit is, ah. So, they're not exactly mantras, but they are forms that exist in, 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 in wolf community. I mean, there's, there's, mm -hmm. there's, there's nuances to growls and howls that I hadn't really paid attention to. And I did a big ritual on one full moon and I was told point blank, like you, you, you need, now you need to take what you started and you need to make it so that people can go and invoke the mother. They can invoke their animal self drop drop their ego and their, their their conscious mind be in a purely feral animalistic state be open to the ecosystem to the to the, the wildness the weird and the way of, of of being out there the the giant the giant complex matrix that is the ecosystem that we ignore because we no longer remember how to interrelate interrelate to it right once you're hooked in by simply going by simply invoking the mother with a with this sort of deep primal sound and the word ma is, is linguistically everywhere in terms of mother right that you you get her immediately like you have connection with gaia and it sounds crazy but every native uh, i don't want to say native what do i want to say every tribal culture i've ever hung out with in guatemala and the mayans in the jungle of guatemala or or um, in, in central Mexico, I hung out with some shamans there, or, or um, you know, in, in all, all of them, the, the Ulchi people that I interviewed and hung out with, the Ulchi shamans from Siberia, the, they all don't understand our division between nature and our life. Like they don't, they understand that we don't, that we don't perceive nature as part of us, that we see ourselves as separate and holy and, and that God made us, and we don't have to care about nature. We don't have to interrelate to it. But every most other cultures, their relationship with nature is crucial to their survival. And nature teaches them everything. I mean, Nadi Ajda, who was a, a shaman, an, an Ulchi shaman from Siberia, I interviewed her uh, for a magazine article for Pangaea magazine. And, and I said, tell me, tell me what you have to say as a as a shaman and she said every step you take on the earth should be one of absolute gratitude because everything comes from nature when we die we go back to nature and the fact that that you guys you know are are oblivious to that is in like incomprehensible to so many people which is why you know you watch i mean right now i'm watching the climate you know, discussions and I, I'm appalled and, and everybody's sort of like, you know, this, this is, this is a truck that's coming at you and, and everybody's just pretending it's not there or, oh, we'll fix it somehow. And it's because we're not listening. We're not paying attention. We're not connected with nature. And I know it sounds, it sounds kind of hippie, but going out into nature and dropping all of that mental baggage and, accessing your animal self and just being and sort of reconnecting with nature 
is incredibly vitalizing. It's healing, it's revitalizing, and it, and it reminds you of what's real because all of this stuff is not real. You know, cultures come and go, civilizations come and go, but the mother earth and, and the things she provides us and the forest, you know, the Lord of the forest and, and the, the, the wave, the, the, the cycles of the moon, all these things, this is where we live. This is, this is internal and external and part of who we are. And we, we are ignoring it. We're ignoring three quarters of what's important in life. Yeah, that's absolutely. My general, that's my that's my speech. <laughs> I agree with all of that. I think that's I think that's a beautiful way <laughs> to look you. at it. Um, Thank you. You know, yeah. I uh, I need a church, right? I can start collecting <laughs> <laughs> a, good, a, a wolf church. <laughs> Back to nature. Yeah, yeah everybody, right. open your howling hymns. <laughs> right, right. Um, that's right. But uh, oh. yeah, you know, I mean, I live um, I live in a city and I don't have a car. So uh, like that connection to nature stuff can be challenging for me. But I still make an effort to, uh, you know, get out to the wilderness areas in the city or the wild parts of the city. And I think that it You've is got some great places. You've got some great places in Portland. Oh, yeah. Can... I'm super lucky. I, I live yeah. very close to... Um, to two sort of like wildlife refuge places. So that's nice. pretty nice. I mean, you, you go where you can go, and, right. but that's, you know, you go there when there's no people. And of course, if you rip up your clothes and dance around and howl, it's a toss up, you know. Hey, this is Portland. Nobody cares. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> By the way, there will be pictures in the show notes. <laughs> I, I do, like I have, I, I'm renting a house now and I have woods in my backyard. You can see. Oh yeah, it looks great. Really, I mean, I have these huge hundred-year-old furs. You know, suddenly I, this was like, you know, the gods have been very kind to me. And I go out there, but there's people around you. I go out there and I do my werewolf magic stuff on the full moon. And the first time I did it, I thought, oh, they're going to they're gonna call the cops, you know. And uh, nope, been at it for two years. Nobody said anything. Though <laughs> one, neighbor, one neighbor came up to me and he goes, uh, hey, you know, I, I think, uh, I think we, you know, we have coyotes again. And I was like, Oh, really? Like, how do you know? And he's like, well, you know, blah, blah, blah. We've been hearing them. And, and, you know, they, and I'm like, wow, I love coyotes. I haven't seen any around here. And he's like, yeah, da, da. they seem to be active, more active on the full moon. And all of a sudden I had a moment of like, Oh, <laughs> I'm the coyote. All right. All right. I own that. I'm a wolf, man, but all right, I'll take coyote. That's fine. That, oh yeah, that was something else I was going to ask you about. This is totally unrelated. I mean, it's only related to your book because it has to do with wolves, but you know, like the program to sort of like re-release and reintroduce the gray wolf into the Pacific Northwest. Um, I mean, I don't know if there have been any real confirmed sightings of them yet on our side of the Cascades, but are you excited? Mount Rainier. Oh, Mount Rainier. Mount Rainier. Yeah. I haven't been paying attention to the news in, in Oregon to see how far they've come. Just, like... just, just, just traces, but yeah, apparently mm-hmm. one of the packs has moved into the Mount Rainier area. Oh, that's exciting. Oh, it makes me so happy. I was just <laughs> uh, I was just up in the Mount Rainier area earlier this summer. I did not see any traces of wolves, unfortunately. But... Yeah, I, it's gonna be it's gonna take a while, but yeah, I'm a I'm a huge fan. Yeah, I'm very happy. Um, for my birthday, I asked for people to donate to Defenders of Wildlife, and I raised five hundred bucks. I'm you know, really I uh, are they are they helping with the with the wolf stuff? Oh yeah. Okay, yeah, I, a lot, a lot, a lot. I'll add a link to that in the show notes too, because uh, I, I think anybody who listens to this is going to have some interest in wolves and, um, you know, Defenders of Wildlife. If they're working with the wolf stuff, you know, go and go to the show notes and help them out. Yeah, and people Def- can contact me anytime they want. You know. Mm-hmm. werewolfmagic.com so i mean it's pretty easy to remember <laughs> best so I just have to name tell people, ever magic with a, magic with a k you right know? because you're in the OTO, <laughs> of course no I, it's nice to differentiate i i will give crowley that one like it's nice to differ, differentiate from stage magic that's true cool. although i'm not sure that it always was differentiated from stage magic true which is and a different I, conversation i we know should... some i know some stage magicians who are like also magicians so yeah it's, and they, I, to them it's all yeah it yeah. all and we yeah. can see plenty of evidence in some of the older stuff that there was actual you know stage magic and magic magic were oh, yeah. kind oh, of yeah. the same uh okay let's i have some more questions about werewolves werewolf magic 
as your werewolf magic, as you started to receive all these rituals and you started to sort of like, uh, you know, collect all the stuff, did you realize right away that it was going to sort of congeal into one system? Or is this something that happened over time? That's a very good question. And I haven't really thought about it, but I know, I knew that I was, this is typical of my, my obsessive compulsive behavior with books. I knew that this was a track I was on. And I knew that I was deeply immersed in this and I was going to have to write it all the way through because that's just how I am. Um, whether it's, you know, Nagas or the Holy Guardian Angel or whatever. And, uh, but I didn't really, I didn't really think of it as a book. I just thought of, I thought of it as my own personal, very weird magical diary and creating, you know, I was creating my own system, but I, I've done that before. Um, I've been in the occult for 50 years, so I've reached the point, you know, 20 years ago where I was, I was like, okay, I love all these systems, but I'm going to start making my own or working, creating, you know, altering them. So this was my own completely unique thing. And I didn't really think anything of it, except that I was nuts. And uh, <laughs> my friends tend to agree. Um, they called it my werewolf fetish, which I thought was both good and bad. I'll take it. <laughs> and uh, so, but I didn't think of it as a book until um, my friends were like, oh yeah, this would make a great book. And I'm like, no, no, this is my, this is my craziness, but no, apparently not. And I've got to say this, this book, this book of all the books I've written, and I've written some pretty serious books. This book has sold more than any of my other books. And I'm getting invitations to be interviewed. And, and um, I don't know what to say. Maybe it was because it happened right in the middle of the COVID crisis and everybody was howling. And uh, <laughs> everybody just needed a release. Everybody, but, but I'm, I'm grateful for people who are interested and people who look past the kind of, you know, cheesy tropes of werewolves and actually took a look at the book and said, oh, wow, this is, there's something here that's actually worthwhile. Um, so how does, uh, if, if somebody were interested in, in werewolf magic, like what, what is the first step? Do they follow the path that you took? Do they get frustrated, go out into the woods and take their clothes off and howl at stuff? I don't recommend my breakdown as a model for, <laughs> for, for magical <laughs> development. So I, I wouldn't say avoid that kind of like losing your shit and throwing yourself in the woods. But I would say buy my book. I mean, I, I hate to sound like I'm shilling my book, but I guess I am. But read my, read my book. And my what I tried to do with the book when I actually wrote and rewrote and rewrote and reorganized it, because of course it was a, it was a, it was a complete hot mess when I, when I, handed it in and Llewellyn said, whoa, no, this is not acceptable. You need to You're like what did a werewolf write this? this? Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no, like, <laughs> no, so I, I mean, you know, I, I hired, you know, I, I had a, a friend who who helped me edit the whole thing and organize it and get my head out of out of out of, you know, my non non-conscious mind, my bring my animal self back up to cognitive cognition again so i would say the book i the book is probably my best answer is what i would hand somebody and say if you want if this is something that interests you um i mean this the, the general conversation i have with people when they tell me how frustrated they are and upset they are and everything seems to be going to hell and and um you know it, it, the world is blah 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 and i'm like you know you need you need to get back to nature you you, you need to you know you go into the woods and all that stuff you realize is, 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 it's ephemeral. It's coming and going. Every age, I'm sure ancient Greeks, you know, had the same angst as ancient Romans, as peasants in the Middle Ages. I mean, everyone is, is, is oh, it's the end of culture. It's the end times. The culture is going. Nature just keeps going on. And, and we, tribal cultures that have done very well and who have, lasted for thousands of years like many native american cultures sort of maintained you know a presence that was not as damaging as our presence they they and you know and i talk to people in other countries you know and who are who are tribal people or however you want to call them i don't i don't want to use a word that's upsetting but they're living they're living with nature and by paying attention to that, they often can be mentally and physically healthier. Obviously, science is a good thing. Obviously, medicine is a good thing. I wouldn't be here without it. 
but we've lost something really precious. And I think it's pretty simple to get it back by just, by just letting go, you know, by mm -hmm. letting, letting, however you want to do it, bringing your animal self up and, and accepting that you're an animal. I mean, if you just look in the mirror every day and say, I am an animal, because a lot of people choke at that because they've been programmed to believe like, no, 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 I'm not an animal. Right. Like, right. Me. Well, no, even, even the kind of, the connotations <laughs> of it are that you are less than human, you know, that you are. Yeah. But we are, you know, we, we do all the things that animals do. We partake of the need, the same nature as animals. Like we are. <laughs> and, and, and we're not as often, not as kind w wolves, wolves and packs take care of each other. They, they don't ever abandon one of their, one of their pack people. Um, and they, they fight off, you know, interlopers, but they almost never kill another wolf. There's a lot of bluffing. They all take care of the children. They all raise, they all raise the children together. You know, a lot can be learned by looking at not all animals, but looking at animals that like wolves that, that, honestly honestly connect with their their peers in a way that is loving and caring and um it'd be nice if people did that more often I mean, it would be and we would probably have an easier time of that if we weren't told all the time that we needed to be struggling against each other correct and and just this belief of what's important i mean you know, I had, I worked mo almost my whole life. I still am working. I'm working, you know, part-time. I tutor autistic kids. I do lots of things and we need to work and that's okay. But at the expense of being interconnected with nature, it's not, it's poisonous because if, if we don't understand that when we go to a store and buy things wrapped in plastic, that they come, we know intellectually they come from nature, but that's not, that's not how we behave. We behave like there's a, there's a line. There's some sort of line that something crosses and all of a sudden it's not nature anymore. My favorite is when I, when I get into arguments with pagans who are, are furious um, um, at people who, who sacrifice animals, but eat them. So for example, I, I traveled across Nepal and India and in Nepal I watched uh, at a Kali temple people sacrificing goats pretty humanely. And then, then they would hand them off to a guy who then cleaned them and gutted them and then cooked them on a barbecue and everybody ate it. Mm -hmm. And and I said, you know, I tell people that and they're horrified. Oh, 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 you know, killing animals is wrong. I'm like, don't you eat meat? Well, yeah, but I mean, the disconnect is so big. I can't even say anything. What can I say? <laughs> because it's wrapped in plastic. It's okay. Because you didn't actually take the responsibility of killing that animal. It's okay. The reality is that we are so separated. We are. That simply going out, you know, a couple of times a week and leaning against a tree and shutting your brain off is a really good idea. And listening, you know, listening and feeling, putting your feet, your naked feet in the earth and, you know, trying to reconnect with your ecosystem. Because then, you, then, you, then you, see, you feel, you know? I I know the feeling, you know, I mean, that feeling that you get when you, you know, step off the road and down onto the path and you can, mm -hmm. you know, the sound of cars feeds behind you and you're kind of like, oh man, why can't it feel like this all the time? Right. It feels real. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe I got to go talk to my wolf now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I think we're heading in that direction. I'm, I'm glad. I'm really glad I could do I that I mean, I've you. got the book. <laughs> <laughs> you got the book. That's yep. the book. That's um, all you need. So let's talk a little bit more about like the uh, so so werewolf magic. Like you've given us a little bit of an idea of what it looks like. You know, there's the um, you know it's happens outside. You know, maybe there's a full moon. Maybe there's not. Right, like that whole werewolf full moon thing is also it's kind a of trope. It's a yeah. bit trope, but but I yeah. I stuck with full moons when I when I looked into shape shifting in general and shamanism in general and 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 also as someone who's been involved in the occult and, and witchcraft and paganism mm -hmm. and we know that we know that the full moon exerts a tremendous amount of pull on you we are mostly water and and it's it's you know we all i mean as a teacher long 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 term teacher i knew around the full moon my students were going to be whack you know <laughs> yeah. and, and and that's and it's you know it's that way and my son my son my son is autistic so that that was always the time when he would be a little bit wacky too so i went with it and it's and and the lunar the lunar power I think is very important. I, I'm not sure 
what else you'd like me to tell you? Um, uh, well, I have some questions then. I, I so right. I'm sort of wondering about like um, so you, you you know there's there's a lot in this book. There's a lot of ritual in this book, uh, or or at least techniques and stuff. And I'm kind of wondering when it comes to werewolf magic, uh, what are some of the what are some of the uh, kind of like uh, ritual uses you found for it? Like, does it have kind of like the practical side, like chaos magic does, where you can do yeah, you yeah, know, civil I, work to help pay your rent and stuff. Yes, okay. yeah. There's a bunch of, when you get to the second part. There's a bunch of spells. I could resist. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, I'm a you know, I love spells. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, so for example, um, okay, I'll give you a practical one. When I I wear a big um, bomber jacket. I'm a I'm not particularly tall, but I'm broad, and I'm you know I used to be fairly strong and big. I'm not quite as strong, but when I'm going into a situation that nowadays, when I go into a situation that I know is going to be a little dicey, like uh, going downtown or a club or something, I don't know. I, I put on my, I, you know, I sort of, I don't completely shift into my upper cortex. I mean, my lower cortex. I don't go into a full trance state, which makes me useless for, um, you know, interacting with people. But I, I go in, I sort of do a, a liminal semi thing and I, 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 use my visualization i use that my my um my astral my double to to create sort of a, a a very faint werewolf um form around me uh and people leave me alone okay they do yeah that makes sense like, i i don't i have a spell in there where you can like if you're you know if you're in a place and you feel like threatened you can you can do a sort of a, a you can shape shift your hands into into claws and um, it's a lot of visualization and, and, you know, focusing and we can call it whatever we want. But the idea is that you come out, you know, if, if you, if you are, if you're engaged in this, you come out with like, and people, people know, they leave you alone. Yeah. <laughs> My students have noticed me growling when I was teaching university and I didn't mean to, I tried to keep it, you know, but you know, I got to, I get to a point now where I slip into it when I'm just like, it's way better than swearing and, and intellectualizing. Just like, mm. <laughs> well, I mean, I think you're getting away with it as long as they keep bringing you apples and not dog biscuits. Right. Well, <laughs> I, I, for Halloween, I always wear a werewolf mask just to scare the living bejesus out. Of them. I'll send you a picture of that too. That's what I did this this Halloween. I got myself a really good one. This is I got gonna... all the kids got all the kids howling. Yeah. Yeah. These yeah, are going I, to be I, the best show notes ever. <laughs> I, I got like fifty kids howling. So here's the thing: the parents, I freak the parents out because it's a really good good outfit. The kids weren't afraid at all. And they are the future. And they would come up and I'd go, and they'd come up, they'd go, I'm not afraid of you. And I go, good, because I'm a good werewolf. And they, they would fist bump me. So I called them the werewolf fist bump, right? Which werewolf like, fist bump. You, you bump and you go, <laughs> so I had 50 kids doing it. And, and the parents are all around the edge looking horrified. And I walked out, I, I left that day, I was like, yeah, yeah, those those kids are gonna go far. And sorry for the sorry parents, but you, you missed that boat. <laughs> well, okay. Well, I mean that's useful. That sounds like good werewolf magic. Right. Uh, and but it also sounds like werewolf magic can be used for more like mystical or theurgic sort of stuff, right? Like you're actually yeah. doing these sorts of communion works where you're talking to like what you call like the Lord of the Forest or Gaia right. or or things of that nature. So the, the moon goddesses that I that I talk about uh, mm -hmm, yeah. are, are this Celine Hecate. Yeah, so. yeah. Uh, which is definitely that'll definitely talk to some PGM folks because there's a lot mm -hmm. of that. right. Um, yeah. So that that kind of gives you a a pretty good complete sort of approach to stuff. It's it's a whole it's got a whole theology behind it. I mean, it's very primal and it's very you know I I, I suppose it's rooted in my pagan and, and craft you know backgrounds, but it just it is what was there. I mean, when I stripped everything away. There was there was the earth, there was the Lord of the Forest who who who's been called by a billion names. You know, I use the term pan a lot or forest. Mm -hmm. And then there's there's the the moon mother, you know, and there's what I mean, there's other deity forms, but in terms of 
nature, those, those are the most important things, I think. Um, and, and that's what came and I've, I've, I think a lot of what I did with werewolf magic was unconsciously trying to strip away everything that was just not needed. And we just cut it, we got it all the way down to a, you know, like a, a two wheels and a, and a seat, you know, or something. <laughs> and, and, and the most primal and the most simple is, uh, to me, is often the most powerful. So I've done so much, I've done a lot of ceremonial magic. It's awesome. I've had some amazing results. I did knowledge and conversation with the Holy Guardian Angel for a year and a half. I was very successful. I had a full vision and, and everything else. I can go on and on about other things. But um, the reality, the true reality for me, especially as I'm getting older, is that um, we're all, all of that stuff is, is Maya, you know, is samsara, and which is fine. It's useful. It's important. I, I, I'm fascinated and love it, and I won't stop doing those sorts of things. But in my most primal state, I'm an animal within nature, and that's kind of amazing. That's a kind of samadhi. That's, uh, I talk about the wildness weird and way. The wildness is the sheer vibrancy and, and wild energy in the woods and, and around us in nature. And then the weird is the interconnectedness of ecosystems, which science scientists still have no clue how ecosystems work. They're so complicated and they're so intricate that they can't begin to figure out how to unravel and, and study it. They're just incredibly, they're divine. Mm -hmm. you know and then and then the way is is uh, was the third one that came to me when i went back to japan to see my friends and i was i was at a shrine in the forest and i had this moment of absolute silence and clarity where i was just not even present and and then all of a sudden i got this kind of like poke from from the wolf who said there you go you know like, <laughs> you're you're not thinking you're being well done and of course that ruined it right away you know but then I realized, like, that's the goal. The mm -hmm. goal is to, that, that whether you call it samadhi or, or whatever you want to call it, Zen, Zen, you know, Taoist perfection of just being, you know, mm -hmm. I, I am, I just sort of exist more than I used to and just, you know, not worry about things as much and just, you know, I go into my garden and I work in my garden and I'm, uh, that's what I, that's where I am. I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's not werewolf magic. The next book. Okay. The next no, book, that I, is, I think that is werewolf magic. I yeah, think I do too. I do too. Yeah. Or at least it's so adjacent to it that it doesn't make sense to draw a line. I have, I actually, I'll drop something else that I haven't said to anybody else. So okay. you're going to get another one. The book pack magic is going to be, is way, way more intense because it's groups uh -huh. and how, and how does this work within groups? You know, mm -hmm. and I've done some group works at festivals and stuff with people and, and outside of festivals. Um, and so I'm starting to learn like what works and what doesn't work and how and the synergy of a group of people all howling together, all shifting together is astounding. It's incredibly like oh, what I, I imagine take weeks, like people drop into a, a, a fugue state into a trance state when there's a whole bunch of people doing it very quickly, which made me understand some of the historical references of groups of people, you know, the Nurai, as, as Harada says, who all turned into werewolves during a festival. And I'm like, oh, I see how that works. Everybody just sort of goes, you know? Mm -hmm. So I, 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 and then the next thing I'm going to do is going to be called feral magic. Everything that I've realized that everything that I'm doing now is actually subsets of feral magic, which is going to be a much broader <laughs> I, I have lost my mind it is you completely... you you found a niche <laughs> well, you found a path lost... you found a path yeah and i found a path and 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 i've lost my mind and i could be happier there there's my byline <laughs> yeah i mean honestly you know i don't think that uh you very often get to see or talk to people you know, I mean, I think a lot of people who are drawn to the occult and to drawn to magic and practices like that, like it, it's because we know something's off, right? But it's pretty seldom that you come across people who have gone into it, found something that like really talks to them, and then they like smile through the entire interview. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm a pretty chipper guy anyway, but, but I think the thing is too, occult means hidden, right? And so people mm -hmm. know. No, I mean, I started, I was a, I was a pagan at nine years old. I was reading, 
I was reading, you know, mythology before I even knew what it was that I was, I took my friends into the woods and we played pagan cults. I swear to God. Oh. And I looked at them like, man, I was a messed up kid. No, we were burning cigarettes, for instance. I made an idol. I made them all pray to it. I swear this is true. Oh, I'm but sure. I, I did was, stuff like that too. <laughs> right? And so I look back and I'm like, man, I was a messed up kid. But the bottom line is I knew I was a pagan from the day one. I, I, whenever I was in trouble or felt bad, I ran into the woods, you know. And uh, I think finding the hidden part of a cult is what everybody wants. But I think the hidden part, for me at least, is not just esoteric knowledge. I've, I've read like everything by Crowley and everything by Kenneth Grant, shout out, because that's going to freak people out right there. And I read every, all the witchcraft stuff. And I hung out in New York City in the 70s when, when the occult boom was happening. And I met so many people and I've, I've seen a lot of things and I've done a lot of rituals. And I've, I've any kind of occult stuff I've tried to read and if I could practice it, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Velinda, you know, was initiated into Tantra in 1980. So it's all, and it's all been wonderful. It's been like a, a Disneyland ride of, of experience and, and I have visions and I, and I, I, they're all very interesting and my inner mind keeps giving me information. But this is different in that it's not about discovering and learning and practicing. It's about, it's about letting go of everything and letting go of, of it all and just throwing yourself into the wildness, mm -hmm. the embrace of nature and letting go and 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 just going with that and then then you're you know my experience is then you're plugged into the greatest magical system in the universe because once once you have these once you're interconnected with the with with the ecosystem you can have visions at least i have visions of the psyllium under my feet and the and the, the water tables that are feeding everything and how the trees are talking to each other and how the animals are all into, I mean, you feel this vast mandala that is, that is around you and you are part of it. If you are conscious of it, you are part of it. And most people aren't conscious of it, which is why they throw Star Starbucks cans on the hiking trail because they're not paying attention. They're not, they're not linked in, you know? Mm -hmm. And so that was probably, I think that's one of the most quote unquote occult things that I've ever done is letting go of all the intellectual stuff. And then I write intellectual books about it, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> Isn't that's, life funny? That's part of that. That's part of that balance I talked about at the beginning, I think, you know? Yeah. Um, yep. Okay. Well, look, you know, We've talked okay. We've talked for a good amount of time. This I, uh, one thing that we didn't really discuss very much that that might be kind of interesting is like oh, I almost it, it feels sort of like backsliding through our conversation, but like sort of the the concept of shape shifting mm. and the nature of shape shifting. Like mm. I, you know, I mean, I think I know what you're talking about when you talk about it. But let's hear, you know, what do you have to say? What is shape shifting? Okay, that's a that's a really good thing to talk about. So um, to cut to cut through a lot of it, I came up with what just looking at the historical stuff and doing research, and and connecting with 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 um, shamanic practices and 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 you know what people do and having read Herodotus and read these people and having met shamans um, who who became shamans because the animal spirits came to them as children. And they work with that and they, they go into trance states and they leave their body and they go into the underworld and they do things. And I've met these people and had these conversations. Putting it all together, I began to realize, okay, you've really got three different stages of shape-shifting. If we get rid of all the tropes and the stuff, the first is going into a deep trance state where you pull out of your conscious mind and you are, you are fully plugged into nature. And, and you can you can either assume what the, what the Viking said was wear the wolf cloak or wear the bear cloak, wear the fur. Um, and you could assume sort of an animalistic, um, you can release your animal self and all of a sudden let that part of you take over and let your conscious mind sink in. And all of a sudden you're stronger than you were and you can see more in the dark. And, and these are all things that I know, I've verified, I've, I've been through it. But we also know this, we know that people, people, in dangerous situations, I mean, like moms have, have been have, have lifted cars off their children and stuff because 
they they drop this this their, their mental thing and their, their body just says you know you're 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 going to do this there's all kinds of stories of people who do things that they shouldn't be able to do under dress and un, under duress under stress right so that's that's the first shape shifting there's lots of techniques for doing that the berserkers uh, viking berserkers would would were sorcerers and warriors and there were bear sark which which became bears and then there were ulf sark which became wolves those were the two main berserkers and they would they would do sorcery work and they would go into a trance state and they would they would they would shake and pound drums and they would go in they would they would pull up their animal self and, and they would become apparent you know to everyone around them they became bigger and stronger and then they'd go into battle and kick ass and so then the, the question is all right is this psychological but but what about when people see things shifting like what about when people see somebody like grow an extra foot and you know right bigger and i've had people say that to me like you, you know you do you did this or that so so that's the first shape shifting and it has part of what we're talking about here is what um contro is a great historian calls the double and he pulls this from greek and roman idea which is we have a soul that's eternal and then we have an energetic body which he calls the double and that energetic body, when we die, our soul goes, our spirit goes. But that that if, if something lasts, you know, if something becomes a ghost, it's the double and it fades away unless it's fed or whatever. Okay, this this is just his his general idea, but it, it fits a lot of these paradigms. So so by sorcerers and witches, and you can read this in the witchcraft trial documents, you can read it in the Greek and the Roman. Sorcerers who were doing Vespalis, they were in in, uh, in Roman, they were werewolves, shapeshifters. They they would extrude, they would they would focus on the double and shape the double into the shape of a wolf or a man wolf, mostly wolf throughout history. Um, the werewolf, the, the man wolf was came later. So then then they would like they would wear it. Then that's what they called wearing the fur, right? And often they wore a fur belt or they were as a symbolic magical link to that. The second shape-shifting thing I saw was going further. And I talked about using the Don Quan, which is what I, I discovered and worked very well, which was the, the fire center and using that to fill your entire body um, and focus on, on the double and then fill your whole body and then go into a full state as far as you can, as far as you want, without actually leaving your body. So that's a more advanced form of shape-shifting and I what I found was I had more I had stronger experiences and people saw different things when they looked at me um the third one I don't tell about in the book and you'll see it's in the appendix I finally pieced together what I'm pretty sure is the real shape werewolf shape-shifting which is a shaman, more essentially a shamanic type practice where 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 ethnogens are psychedelic drugs are probably used they used to use a you know ointment that had horrible things but you can you know you don't need to do that anymore and drumming swaying all these ancient sort of time-honored shamanic techniques for going into trance state and then they would they would they would spend years under tutelage crafting uh, uh, their their uh, their double into the form of a wolf and then then in a sort of intense um, cathartic ritual they would leave their body they would astral travel essentially but instead of just travel around they would push their their consciousness into the wolf form and then become catatonic and then uh. go around as wolves. and you'll see it in the last the last thing they didn't want to put it in there and i said no i want it in the i, I want it in, I want it in the, and i say don't do this because i i'm not going to do it it took it took many, I could tell from reading about it, especially I got read Slavic sources that were very good, mm -hmm. uh, that, uh, you know, you're in a catatonic state. And this, the best part about this, or the most interesting part about it is over and over and over and over again in these stories, as you'll read through the book, they talk about witches who are accused of, of, were, of werewolfism. The werewolf gets shot with an arrow. They go to the witch's house, the witch is in a coma and has the same wound on their right, body right. as the wolf. And you see this again and again and again. They also always say, always, whether it's Greek, Roman, uh, whatever, that wolf, that you know it's a werewolf because it has human eyes. So, oh. so is that interesting? Yeah. So, um, so, so, and this is Herodotus says this, a lot of these historians say, yeah, this is what they do. Um, my favorite is Petronius, who talks about the soldier 
who um, who who accompanied him, he was he was doing a long he was doing a trading thing at night and he was worried about brigands and he hired a soldier to go with him and halfway to where he was going the soldier said i'm sorry it's a full moon i gotta go and and turned into a werewolf and ran away and, and he's a historian right so he's like damn and he, he you know he, he went on by himself comes to a farm says can i spend the night here and there's a bunch of hullabaloo and the farmer goes oh no yeah 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 sure you can see her but you know we just were attacked by a wolf and it, it got it got one of the sheep but we wounded it in the throat with a spear and he's like, oh, wow, mm, okay. So long, long story short, he goes back to Rome and he's mad at this, this, at this, this soldier. So he goes to his door and he goes to his house and knocks on the door and, and goes in and the guy's lying in bed with a wound to his throat, right? I mean, this is a Roman, this is a mm-hmm. Roman story. This is not, this is not, you know, goosebumps, okay? <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and, and he's got, you know, and he says, yeah, I'm a werewolf and yeah, it's, and everybody was like, oh, yeah, he's a werewolf. And so, <laughs> used to be okay, you know, it used to be okay. I mean, the, hopefully they don't, you know, burn me at the stake, but I don't think they will. They have to, I, they have to catch me first. Well, I mean, luckily you're in Seattle and it's really wet. It's super right. hard to burn people at the stake up there. <laughs> it's exactly, yeah. Yeah, exactly right. So uh, one of my um, listeners uh, sent in a question, and of course, I, I don't think he had a chance to read your book or anything like that. So, uh, but his his question was: um, uh, Is there a connection between Native American, the Native American shapeshifter concept, and the European werewolf, or is this just another case of us uh, painting over a New World belief with some sort of European concept? That's a really good question, and I'm going to punt it, and I'll tell you. Um, because I've traveled in the, in the Navajo nation and skinwalkers, which is what he's referring to, I think, mm-hmm. um, have an extremely negative, um, connotation there and uh. are seen as evil and are seen as, um, dark magic and they do terrible things. So as I was doing, researching this book, um, I've done my very best to not get involved at all in any kind of cultural appropriation. Um, I mentioned I think that's a good approach. I, I, well, and Llewellyn is very big on this now too, which I think is a great thing. So I talk about shamanism because I hung out with shamans and I have an article, I have an, a URL in there that will take you to an interview I did with an ultra shaman. And I, I am fully aware for everybody listening that the term shaman comes from Siberian shamans who I hung out with. So, <laughs> so I hung out with shamans in Guatemala, in Mexico, um, people who are very similar to shamans in Nepal and India. And the techniques are kind of similar, but I don't want to talk about Native American things because I'm not Native American and it's not, it's not polite or it's not right for me to do that. Okay, that makes sense. I think that's a that's a really responsible way to look at it. And uh, we have enough um, European and uh, Mediterranean werewolf lore to explore mm-hmm. without Nordic, yeah, yeah. Nordic, Nordic mm-hmm. Mediterranean. That's right. It's, yeah, things are different in different places. But I will say this: every country I've ever been to has shapeshifters, mm-hmm. and and some are seen as positive and negative so, and many are seen as positive and um a few like like that are seen as as purely negative so it it's it it depends it really depends like in 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 Vudan, you know i'm i'm also a voodoo I, I i i have connection with 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 loa and i have uh you know anyway i'm involved in that world too um and there there are um there are loop guru, there are werewolves, but they're seen also as pretty negative in mm-hmm. Bhutan. And also just staying out of that because I'm not an expert in Bhutan and I'm not part of that culture. I stayed away from that as well. So. Right, right. But you did, you'll find. Yeah. Hey, thank you so much. This has been an amazing interview. I really, really enjoyed this topic. Your book is really fun. I'm looking forward wow. to finish it, finishing it and... Um, you know, howling at a moon sometime soon, possibly. Oh, don't wait for that. Just, oh, <laughs> keep up howling if you want. Well, <laughs> we will you know see. A, you know there's a Facebook page called, called Howl at 8 p.m. that has like 80,000 people on it. And they all howl at 8 p.m.? They did during the pandemic, during the worst of the pandemic, everybody was out there howling. I was like, 
That's werewolf magic. <laughs> <laughs> well, I like that. Um, okay, so you've already mentioned your website is uh, werewolfmagic.com. Right. Uh, your book, Werewolf Magic, is currently available from Llewellyn. I'll make sure that there's a link to that. And then your other book, uh, werewolf, werewolf Pack, Pack magic. magic, should be out at the end of 2022, later in 2022. Uh, September, what I'm told is September 2022. Okay, that's awesome. And um, I have a, I have an Instagram page, Denny Sargent Author, and I have a Facebook page, Denny Sargent Author. If okay, people, I'll, it's I'll, a little bit overload of everything. I'll include there. links to all of that stuff, including um, your werewolf art gallery, uh, <laughs> and defenders of the wildlife, and uh, other stuff like that. So, um, so thank you again. This was uh, this was excellent. I was really happy. This has been another episode of the Arnamancy Podcast. Thank you for joining me. I have been your host, Reverend Eric. You can find Arnamancy online at arnamancy.com, and you can subscribe to this podcast anywhere podcasts are found. If you like what you hear, please consider supporting the Arnamancy Project for as little as $1 a month at patreon.com slash arnamancy. 